care. Lord, you have shown us that the power of your love, the power to forgive any hurt that has come our way. Give us the humble faith and raw courage to feel our feelings. Ponder them, possess them, and express them. With love to those who have hurt us. Help us let go of fighting out of anger and fleeing out of fear. Help us to move instead towards forgiveness through faith in you. Amen. Thank you, MLA Marcellos. Our next item is to review an adoption of the agenda. Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, prayer review of agenda and adoption. Sorry, adoption of agenda. Declarations of conflict of interest. Public matters will be presentation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in relation to Section 35 by Dr. Joshua Nichols, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law. And then we will go into an in camera with committee business. Uh, new business parking lot at date and time of next meeting, Wednesday, May 18th at 10 a.m. and adjournment. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Can I have a motion? I'll move that motion, Madam Chair. Thank you, MLA Johnson. MLA Johnson has moved adoption of the agenda. The motion is in order. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest? Hearing none, I will move into our next item. Today, the Special Committee on Reconciliation and Indigenous Affairs is receiving a public presentation with a focus on the relationship between Section 35 of the Indian Act and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Our presenter is Dr. Joshua Nichols, Assistant Professor at the, law, at the University of Alberta Faculty of Law. Welcome. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. To respect physical distancing requirements, this meeting will be held virtually and attended by the Deputy Chair, Mr. Johnson, at the committee, and the, commi the committee clerk, Cynthia James, committee advisor, Kathleen Nosh, and committee support, James Thomas. I will ask the members and the presenter to please wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking and to direct all comments and questions and remarks through me. I will now ask the members to introduce themselves for the record. Ms. Marcellos, I'll start with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, Frida Marcellos. I'm the MLA for Sabacha. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Johnson. Rylan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Uh, glad to have you here today, Dr. Nichols. And those committee members that are joining us virtually. Madam Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm the Premier, uh, Minister of Executive and Indigenous Affairs, the Minister of the COVID Secretariat, and the MLA for Ranch Lake, Cutty Yellowknife. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. Nichols. Thank you. Minister Simpson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm R.J. Simpson, the MLA for Hay River North, as well as the Minister of Education, Culture and Employment, and the Minister of Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Minister Wozniak has sent her regrets for this meeting. I will now invite Dr. Nichols to pr proceed with any opening remarks 
uh, and introduce himself and any opening remarks he may have. Hi, um, my name is uh, Joshua Nichols. Um, as as mentioned, I, I teach uh, at the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. Um, joining you today from uh, Treaty 6 territory, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for inviting me to present to you today. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. You may um, begin with your presentation. Sorry, I did got a, a little bit of a delay there. Did you say I may begin? <laughs> yes, you may begin with your presentation. Okay. Thanks, sorry, there's a little bit of a, a delay. Thank you. <clears throat> so given the fact that the speakers that you've heard from thus far have focused the majority of their attention on UNDRIP, and that you'll soon have the benefit of uh, Professor Brenda Gunn's expert advice in this area, I'll be focusing my attention on the relationship between Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982 and UNDRIP. I'll do this by taking a historical and contextual approach to the development of reconciliation in the case law and to its relationship with Section 9124 of what is now known as the Constitution Act 1867. I'll begin by unpacking what the court in Sparrow referred to as the constitutional background and show how the presuppositions that structure the Section 35 case law are reliant on the colonial era legal fiction of discovery. In short, while Canada may well be the leader in developing a constitutional doctrine of Aboriginal rights, this doctrine is foundationally flawed and in desperate need of principled remediation. From this basis, I'll then move on to a more detailed account of the prospective implementation of UNDRIP and the implications for the current interpretations of Aboriginal law in Canada. I'll then conclude by outlining some of the guiding principles that could help us move beyond the colonial limitations of our existing understanding of reconciliation in the Canadian courts. So the Canadian courts have struggled and continue to struggle with the legacy of colonialism. There are a series of cases that have relied on colonial legal doctrines that diminish the legal standing of Indigenous peoples by appeal to a hierarchy of civilizations. In these cases, the courts recognize that the colonial version of crown sovereignty, which allows them to posit that the mere assertion of crown sovereignty strips indigenous peoples both of their political existence and their lands and leaves them with a box of rights. This constitutional model of reconciliation is unable to meaningfully progress because it presents us with a narrative where Indigenous peoples are magically transformed into a cultural minority on their own territories by the mere assertion of European sovereignty. This is not the only model of reconciliation that our courts have developed, but it is the one that we do need to honestly and openly account for if we want to move towards an understanding of reconciliation that is based on the forms of mutual recognition that we can see, however imperfectly, in the process of treaty making. Over 30 years ago in Sparrow, the Supreme Court recognized that Section 35.1 of the Constitution Act 1982 presents the culmination of a long and difficult struggle uh, in both the political forum and the courts for the constitutional recognition of Aboriginal rights. Despite this, the court went on to hold that there was, from the outset, never any doubt that sovereignty and legislative power, and indeed underlying title to such lands vested in the Crown. This statement establishes the background that allows the court to reconcile what they refer to as federal power under Section 9124 with what they deem to be federal duty that is recognized and affirmed in Section 35. The obvious problem with this background is that there is no legal explanation for the disappearance of the indigenous, uh, uh, rather, so of the indigenous issue, property, so and this Sunday. brings it into tension with the court's prior rejection of colonial doctrines that diminish the legal capacity of indigenous peoples. For example, as Justice Dixon stated in 1985 in Simon versus the Queen, the colonial doctrines of civilizational hierarchy that Justice Patterson relied upon in R.V. Silliboy, in his words, reflect the biases and prejudices of another era of our history, and that such language is no longer acceptable in Canadian law. 
the thin to the point of being non-existent background uh, basis for, of this background that the court articulated in Sparrow is apparent when we consider the precedents that the court relied upon as, as in what they cited for authority. The 1823 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Johnson v. McIntosh, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and three specific pages from the Supreme Court's decision in Calder. The citations do not provide a clear and stable foundation for the court's articulation of Crown sovereignty. First off, it is not clear the precise principle the court is citing from Johnson v. McIntosh. Certainly, it would be a stretch to suggest that Johnson stands for the proposition that Indigenous peoples lost all sovereign and self-governing authority over their territories upon European discovery, and that such discovery subjects them to unfettered Crown regulatory authority. Yet, this seems to be the precise sense in which the Sparrow Court uses the case. Further, as anyone familiar with federal Indian law in the United States knows, Johnson v. McIntosh is the first case in the Marshall Trilogy and lays out a version of the, uh, of, doc- of the Doctrine of Discovery that the subsequent two cases go on to heavily qualify, if not outright reject. In addition, the specific pages cited from Calder include Justice Hall's move from Johnson v. McIntosh to Worcester v. Georgia, the third case in the trilogy, and Justice Judson's statement that the origin of title does not come by way of European recognition, but the fact that, quote, when the settlers came, the Indians were there, organized in societies and occupying the land as their forefathers had done for centuries. Despite this fact, the Canadian courts have continuously interpreted Section 9124 in a way that unilaterally excludes Aboriginal peoples from the division of powers and subjects them to the concurrent jurisdiction of both Parliament and the legislatures. This unilateral exclusion has no legitimate historical basis, and it has served to inform the approach that the court has taken to the interpretation of treaties, the Indian Act, as well as the test for the infringement of rights and title. The unilateral exclusion is clearly evident in recent decisions. For example, in Chilcotin Nation, it can be seen in both the continuation of the unilateral right of infringement and the removal of the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity from Aboriginal title lands, which results in overlapping provincial and federal jurisdiction, leaving no meaningful room for Indigenous jurisdiction. There is another way of reading 9124, namely as a power to negotiate with Indigenous nations as equal partners in confederation and an obligation to honour existing agreements regarding Indigenous lands. The notion of Indigenous peoples being in an equal partnership with the Crown is by no means a new one. In fact, it was a recommendation that the Royal Commission of 1664 made to Charles II. The possibility of this alternative interpretation of Section 9124 highlights the problematic foundation of the Court's current approach to Section 35. If we had turned our attention to the foundation of the Court's interpretation of Section 35 in Sparrow, which is, after all, the first case to interpret Section 35, we see that the Court's unquestioning assumption of Crown sovereignty legislative power and underlying title necessarily entails that the court is holding indigenous peoples to be in a sovereign to subjects relationship on the basis of nothing more than a unilateral proclamation by interpreting section 9124 as federal power over indians and their lands the court magically transforms indigenous peoples into subjects the only possible basis for this reading is the pernicious set of racist European 19th century fictions um, that include the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius. We would do well to remember that it is the Sparrow Court that introduces the term reconciliation into our case law. But we need to ask ourselves what exactly was being reconciled. They take two provisions of two constitutional documents separated by 115 years and with the words, never any doubt, they managed to maintain Section 9124 as federal power and convert Section 35.1 into a paternalistic federal duty to be managed and mediated by the courts. This is the foundation of the so-called full box of rights approach. If the background in, uh, set out in Sparrow is simply accepted, we are driven to the conclusion that the Crown has sovereignty legislative power and underlying title, whereas Section 35 provides charter-like protections and a sui generis species of rights. 
This seems to fit with the court's claim in the secession reference that Section 35 is an example of Canada's long tradition of protecting minorities, yet it supplies no explanation for how Indigenous peoples became minorities on their own lands. But this conclusion begs the question of what exactly happened to Indigenous sovereignty. In order to backfill this omission, the courts have either recharacterized the treaties as surrender agreements or simply adopted colonial legal fictions to diminish the legal capacity of indigenous peoples and thereby pave the way for the crown's unilateral assertion of sovereignty as having the effect of locking indigenous peoples into a constitutional straitjacket that they can only leave if they are able to avail themselves of democratic institutions that were imposed on them. Neither of these options provide a solution to the problem. Rather, they add in the troubling notion that the courts are providing the color of legality to the Crown's unilateral assertion of sovereignty over Indigenous peoples. Such a move necessarily brings us into what Professor David Dysonhaus has referred to as a grey hole in our constitutional order. It is concerning not only because of the negative effects it has on Indigenous peoples, but also on the form of sovereign authority that it necessarily attributes to the Crown. That is, a mysterious prerogative power that enables the executive to declare sovereignty over other peoples and thereby dissolve their national character without being subject to judicial review. This is the kind of absolute sovereign authority that both the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and later the American Revolutionary War in 1775 were reacting against, and this re um, rejection forms the core principles of the constitutional tradition that Canada has inherited. In other words, the stakes of simply accepting the background of Sparrow at face value are nothing less than the meaning of the rule of law. This box of rights conception of Section 35 is by no means the only available approach to Indigenous Crown relations. In fact, I argue that by removing the colonial legal fictions that persist within 9124, the legal paradigm of the Indigenous Crown relationship shifts from charter-like rights to jurisdiction within a federal division of powers this has the benefit of being an interpretive move that is squarely within the purview of the Supreme Court. As the guardians of the Constitution, they are tasked with, the interp with interpreting its provisions, and so they cannot claim that they require a new provision from the legislative branches. Rather, they bear the full responsibility of retaining an interpretation of Section 9124 that can only be grounded in 19th century international law. By providing a realistic interpretation of the nature of federal power under 9124, the court could no longer rely on it to treat Section 35 as if it was within the Charter, and therein subject to either the reasonable limitations imposed by Section 1 or provincial override in Section 33. This paradigm shift from contingent rights to jurisdiction is indeed a realistic possibility, as the court can draw from its own reasoning in the secession reference and Manitoba language rights to reset the relationship. This is what the Prime Minister's rhetoric of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship should mean, as RCAP argued and Indigenous peoples have constantly maintained for the last 250 years. As it is pr uh, precisely this struggle, and it is precisely rather this struggle, that UNDRIP legislation that you are contemplating could actually play a role in. So, with the background of Sparrow in mind, I'd like to now turn our attention to what the role of uh, UNDRIP implementation could play in removing the colonial presuppositions that persist within uh, the court's current understanding of reconciliation. In order to provide you with an overview of my approach, I'm going to have to start with some basic context. So, on May 10th, 2016, Canadian Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett addressed the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues at the United Nations and officially endorsed UNDRIP, without the qualifi qualifications attached by the previous government. She further stated that Canada intends, quote, nothing less than to adopt and implement the Declaration in accordance with the Canadian Constitution. End quote. This is a distinct shift away from the previous government's approach to UNDRIP, which held it to be strictly aspirational. On September 21st, 2017, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau addressed the United Nations General Assembly and reiterated this commitment. He took the opportunity to point to the many legacies of colonialism in Canada. As he put it, the good news is that Canadians get it. They see the inequalities and they're fed up with the excuses, and that impatience gives us a rare and precious opportunity to act. 
we now have before us an opportunity to deliver true, meaningful, and lasting reconciliation. Well, we could dismiss this statement on its own as a continuation of the status quo of the current judicially mediated process of reconciliation. This is not necessarily the case. In fact, the status quo interpretation is distinctly countered by the Prime Minister's insistence that the basic norms of UNDRIP are not aspirations, but rather they will be used to guide the process of reconciliation. They provide, in his words, a way forward. As the Prime Minister noted in his speech, We are in uncharted territory. No one has paved the way for us, but we cannot wait. The time has come for us to pave the way together. The time has come to get off the beaten path, to move away from old, outdated colonial structures and to establish new structures, which will respect the inherent rights of indigenous peoples to govern themselves and to determine their future. What this should clearly signal is that the language of law and policy relating to reconciliation in Canada is entering a period of sudden and potentially dramatic change. On November 28, 2019, the province of British Columbia passed Bill 41, or the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. This legislation implements UNDRIP as provincial law. Bill 41 is modeled on the proposed legislation that was first introduced by Romeo Saganash as a private member's bill, uh, C-262, on April 21st, 2016. That bill ultimately died on the order paper in the Senate, as we all well know. We are told that new federal legislation is now in development, but it is uh, clear that we are entering uncharted territory. The actual meaning of this change hinges on the question of what implementation in accordance with the Canadian Constitution actually looks like. At this point, it seems to me that there are two possible approaches to implementation. My aim here will be to outline these two possible approaches, examine their underlying assumptions, and suggest that the way forward is to stop seeing Section 35 as a full box of rights and start seeing it as jurisdictional in nature. I'll then conclude by pointing to how this nation-to-nation approach to Canadian federalism is a more adequate reflection of the last 250 years of Indigenous Crown relations. So first, the status quo approach. So in the same 2016 speech, Minister Bennett also stated that Section 35 of the Constitution Act 82 provides a robust framework and a full box of rights. This could be read as a signal that the current Sparrow Framework, with all of its unilateral principles and doctrines, will be used to restrict the content of UNDRIP. Now, if this is the case, then it seems from the perspective of the federal government, the box of rights is already full, and the change of policy little more than a slight shift of emphasis. This approach is grounded on the Supreme Court's existing interpretation of the relationship between 35 and 9124. As I've already noted, the foundation of this full box of rights approach is little more than a a set of unilateral assertions and a collection of citations from Johnson v. McIntosh, Royal Proclamation, and Calder, which all actually connect back to the doctrine of discovery. Given these unstable foundations, what would occur if UNDRIP implementation was used as a way forward, or rather was used as uh, a way of maintaining the status quo? Naturally, any answer to this question at this point in time is going to be speculative as we do not know the specific legislative approach that the federal government will take. Some scholars have already begun to raise questions about the compatibility of the basic principles of UNDRIP with the existing jurisprudence, and their conclusions do point to significant interpretive problems. The only thing we could say for certain is that if the government elects to take the status quo approach, the complexity of the current Section 35 jurisprudence could well increase. At the moment, the so-called full box of rights subdivides roughly into rights, title, treaties, and the duty to consult and accommodate. Each one of these areas is beset by thorny jurisprudential questions, from the question of the possibility of commercial or unlimited rights, I think here of a house it, the problem of provincial jurisdiction in Chocotan Nation, the interpretation of treaties, I think in particular Grassy Narrows and Chief Mountain come to mind. Cumulative effects and delegation, Clyde River and Chippewas of the Thames are good examples. The process of litigating claims via Section 35 is costly, procedurally complex, and uncertain, even in cases in which the court seems to offer a clear decision 
The practical outcomes of that decision may well be marginal, for instance, in Gladstone, or so delayed that the actual value of the process itself is undermined. Tanaha Nation comes to mind. It is difficult to see who exactly benefits from a process of litigation that takes decades to resolve any given conflict and then results in decisions whose jurisprudence is so dense and convoluted that the only certainty it can deliver is the promise of further litigation to work on the new legal knots that it's tied. This full box of rights does not offer the kind of procedural clarity and legal certainty that the government promises to third-party proponents nor does it serve the indigenous peoples who struggle with dreadful environmental and socioeconomic problems. The only real beneficiary of the existing convoluted system of multi-layered consultative processes, secretive MOUs, and the production of voluminous expert reports are the experts, consultants, and lawyers who operate it. I'm not suggesting that these various professionals are unnecessary to the solution of the problem of the indigenous crown relationship. I am, after all, included in their number. Rather, if the process itself is demonstrably failing to deliver on even its most basic aims, namely procedural clarity, legal certainty, and improving the everyday reality of indigenous peoples, then it is about as productive as an expedition glided by a blank map. As I see it, there is no need to bother asking whether the, uh, the box is full or empty. It's simply the wrong kind of box altogether. The real path to reconciliation, that is the one that is not circular, is the one that leads to a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. This is more than a change in language. It is a change in the legal political paradigm from rights to jurisdiction. And this is precisely where UNDRIP implementation can offer a real way forward. So now I'll focus on the possibility of a nation-to-nation -nation approach to the use of UNDRIP legislation. So the first point that we need to be cognizant of is that UNDRIP does not introduce the possibility of a shift to an inherent jurisdictional approach to the Crown Indigenous relationship. The roots of this approach extend back over 250 years to the Peace and Friendship Treaties in the early 18th century. To the Royal Proclamation in 1763, and the Treaty of Niagara in 1764, and continue past Confederation, even as the rights-based approach um, becomes dominant by the mid-19th century. We can refer to this model as treaty federalism, or, following Professor John Burroughs, as Canada's indigenous constitution. The practices of treaty federalism persist to this day in the practices of treaty-making and negotiated settlements. The jurisdictional approach also surfaces in a number of key government reports. Immediately following the patriation of the Constitution in 1982, the Penner Report re recommended that the proper approach to Section 35 was for the federal government to, in their words, occupy and vacate Section 9124 to clear jurisdictional space for Indigenous self-government. They also clearly indicated that the rights-based solution of devolving powers to municipal-like Indigenous governments, quotes, fails to take account of their origins and rights of Indian First Nations in Canada, end quote. And they presciently warned that litigation in the Supreme Court was not the best solution, as the procedure is, quote, difficult to execute and uncertain in its outcome, end quote. The question of where the Indigenous right of self-government fits into the Constitution was also slated to be resolved in the Constitutional Conferences following 1982. But the failures of Meech Lake and the Charlottetown Accords has left this as the unfinished business of the Canadian Constitution. This point is forcefully driven home by the recommendations of the Royal uh, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in 1996. And again, in the final report and cause to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015. The point of this summary is that UNDRIP does not introduce the possibility of a jurisdictional approach to Section 35. Rather, UNDRIP offers a set of tools to help us see what has been taking place within Canada over the last 250 years more adequately. Implementation should not be understood as simply making an international legal instrument conform to the existing confines of the Canadian Constitution. It should be seen as an opportunity to reconsider the fundamental presuppositions about the relationship between Indigenous peoples and the Canadian Constitution. Put differently, UNDRIP is not the source of this shift from rights to jurisdiction. It simply provides a set of tools to help move the existing model 
um, to the diverse federalism that indigenous peoples have consistently advocated for and patiently practiced over the last 250 years. This point is clearly driven home by the TRC in the final report. They recommended that Canada move beyond the old sovereign to subjects framework and adopt the current international norms expressed in UNDRIP. As the commission forcefully reminds us, the doctrine of discovery and the related concept of terra nullius underpin the requirement for Aboriginal peoples to prove their pre-existing occupation of the land in court cases in order to avoid having their land and resource rights extinguished in contemporary treaty and land claims processes. This, such a requirement does not conform to international law or contribute to reconciliation. Such concepts are a current manifestation of historical wrongs and should be formally repudiated by all levels of Canadian government, end quote. This is a clear and direct rejection of the absolute interpretation of 9124 and the framework of reconciliation that has been built upon it. It is a rejection of the racist fictions of international law that continue to inform the interpretation of Canada's constitutional order. They continue, We are not suggesting that the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery necessarily gives rise to the invalidation of Crown sovereignty. The Commission accepts that there are other means to establish the validity of Crown sovereignty without undermining the important principle established in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which is that the sovereignty of the Crown requires that it recognize and deal with Aboriginal title in order to become perfected. It must not be forgotten that the terms of the Royal Proclamation were explained to and accepted by Indigenous leaders during the negotiation of the Treaty of Niagara in 1764. So this constitutes a repositioning of the basis of the legitimacy of Crown sovereignty from the fictions of the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius to processes of mutual agreement and consent that are found in the histories of treaty making. This also necessarily shifts Indigenous peoples from being wards who are subject to unlimited sovereign power to being peoples in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the Crown. We can think of this as being a change of conceiving as Canada as a unitary nation-state with a rigid unilateral version of sovereignty to being a nation-to-nation -nation federal state with a concept of sovereignty that is and always has been flexible and shared, even if it has only been honoured in the breach. The current Canadian government is making clear steps towards realizing this shift from a sovereign to subjects rights-based approach to a nation-to-nation uh, -nation jurisdictional approach. The legislation, rather, the legislative adoption of, of UNDRIP is one step towards returning to real, meaningful reconciliation. It helps by uh, us to move forward in two related ways. First. The contrast and tension between UNDRIP concepts like self-determination and free prior and informed consent and our domestic jurisprudence allows us to have more meaningful debates over the future of reconciliation. This contrast helps to highlight the continued reliance on 19th century colonial fictions in Canadian domestic law, which have managed to be hide in plain sight because they are so familiar that many have failed to even account for them. Second. It reminds us that Indigenous peoples in the Crown share sovereignty. The nature of this partnership is described in the final report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in Volume 2 as shared sovereignty. As they put it, shared sovereignty, in our view, is a hallmark of the Canadian Federation and a central feature of the three-cornered relations that link Aboriginal governments, provincial governments, and the federal government. These governments are sovereign within their respective spheres and hold their powers by virtue of the con their constitutional status rather than by delegation. Nevertheless, many of their powers are shared in practice and may be exercised by one more than one order of government. So the concept of shared sovereignty is instructive in my view as it helps to clarify what the court in Sparrow meant when it stated that the relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples is, in their words, trust-like rather than adversarial. The clarification is provided by the fact that Indigenous peoples are sovereign, quote, by virtue of their constitutional status rather than by delegation, end quote. Justice Binney rightly summarizes the nature of the concept of shared sovereignty in Mitchell as being, in his words, partnership without assimilation. <laughs> 
This is the other side of our Section 35 jurisprudence. It is founded on the principles of mutual recognition and consent. And I think it's a helpful reminder that the Supreme Court has stated that the concept of the honor of the crown recognizes the impact of the superimposition of European laws and customs on pre-existing Aboriginal societies by imposing a heavy obligation on the crown to reconcile with Aboriginal peoples as equals in confederation. The substantial meaning of this equality is based in the fact that the assertion of crown sovereignty must be reconciled with the fact that Aboriginal peoples were here first and that they were never conquered. Thus, the terms like occupation and trust-like cannot be understood as diminishing the status of Aboriginal peoples as sovereign peoples, as to do so would be to conflate partnership with assimilation. The concepts of UNDRIP thus do not introduce the notion of consent into Canadian law, they remind us of the fact that it has always been a part of our constitutional history. And if we are sincere in our desire to confront the hard truths of our colonial history and move towards meaningful reconciliation, it is the version of our constitution that is built upon the guiding principles of treaty making that we need to follow. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nichols, for your presentation. Um, so I will now allow questions um, or comments from our committee members. So I will, I just kind of started with a list and the first one I have on my list is MLA Johnson, just because I see you right there center. <laughs> Uh, th thank you, Dr. Nichols, for your presentation. I, I, I guess I just want to color that. I, I think to some extent, uh, almost all of us in this committee in our government agrees that this is this paradigm shift is what we're aiming for with UNDRIP implementation. Mm -hmm. And we, I think even on the ground, there, there's been frustration for the kind of limitations of Section 35 just becoming, you know, a glorified duty to consult on this largely hunting and fishing rights. And, and the Northwest Territories has moved beyond that in many ways. Um, whether that's actually reflected in, you know, anything, uh, legislation or the Constitution is, you know, we're not quite there. But I guess our main tool for recognizing some sort of path, as, as you've outlined presently, is, is the negotiation of modern treaties. And, you know, the mm -hmm. Northwest Territories is ahead of Canada in, in accomplishing that. And, you know, hopefully within my lifetime, our entire territory will be negotiated and the vast majority of land will, will stop being crown land. It will belong to Indigenous governments. But I guess I would like you to any of your comments or insight on, on the limitations of, of the current treaties we're negotiating or the limitations of using that process to kind of land us in this, you know, truly trilateral sovereign country where we have indigenous governments, provincial territorial governments and federal governments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, uh, th thank you very much for that question. Uh, oh, sorry, um, was someone saying something? No, I just was... Just redirecting, just because it makes it oh, easier yes, so ahead. everyone knows. Where <laughs> Sorry. Yes, go ahead, Dr. Nichols. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I see that this legislation is curious legislation because it's interpretive legislation, right? It's giving um, the color of legislation to concepts that are coming out of UNDRIP, and that, in a certain sense, is an invitation to governments and as well to courts to draw from that as legislation. In a certain sense, it clears the way for them to draw from those concepts, which they can already do, but they're hesitant to do because they're very reliant upon legislation. So what I, I see this as doing as perhaps clearing some of the ground uh, of the air above the groundwork that's being done uh, on modern trees um, up in the territories. Uh, when we look at cases like, uh, for example, Chief Mountain on, on the, the nature of modern treaties um, and the, the legitimacy of the parties and how to negotiate, the, the courts are getting confused about how to deal with Section 35 um, and understand these relationships. And so they defaulted in that case uh, to say that, well, it could be an act of delegation and we're just not going to look into the Indigenous Party's uh, validity in any way, shape or form. And by doing that, uh, it's handy in law as an interpretive maneuver, but it doesn't clarify the relationship between the parties. 
and it tends to persist in this idea that this is actually an act of delegation. These are final agreements. And the court um, is, like I would characterize Section 35 litigation, as you probably uh, have, have experienced, as, as kind of mixed, right? It, it is split between principles that don't cohere. It has unilateral doctrines that it relies upon and defaults to in some cases, and then it has consensual um, and mutual agreement doctrines that it defaults to in other cases. And I think that this kind of legislation is by no means um, a catch-all solution to this problem in our case law, but I think that it provides um, justices uh, in courts with an interpretive drawer that they're more than welcome to draw from to try to push um, on Section 35 doctrines in a way to encourage them towards the, the, the better side of them, right? The side of them ha- that has a future a- in terms of reconciliation. Because as you, as you point out, uh, the duty to consult and accommodate, like if we look at the era, like just before um, uh, our, our current pandemic reality, uh, we were looking at results from, from cold water on the TMX decision following up of Slewa Tooth that sounds radically different from what happened in Slewa Tooth and is covered with the word veto. Um, and yet never mentions the fact that the Haida framework uh, in Haida Nation has the concept of consent, right? Um, they treat that as if it's an aside and tend to view it almost through the lens of just pure administrative law. And uh, the reaction of, of the Slewa Tooth was to say that reconciliation is dead, right? Uh, and if we look at Coastal Gaslink and, and the attempt... Um, um, to use indigenous law as, as the basis for an injunction and you know a, a bc superior court judge just not having the resources in the case law to understand how to deal with that and defaulting to a way of interpreting that that actually just doesn't make sense within common law um let alone um let alone interpreting indigenous laws on its own terms so um I guess it's a long sort of scattershot way of responding to, to your question um, is that I, I really do see that this legislation is a, is a potentially helpful step, right? Um, and, and hopefully could clear some of um, the, the clouds that obscure what happens in on the ground with actual treaty making processes um, up into the courts. So we get a more coherent understanding of our constitution. Uh, anyway, hopefully that was helpful. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. MLA Johnson. Yeah, thank. That is helpful. I, I mean, I it, it puts a big task on us as legislators to go and find the words to put in that legislation. And, and I think mm-hmm. when we look at the BC or federal examples, like they're, they're not, they're falling short of you know really giving that direction to to anyone other than perhaps departments to create some action plans. Um, mm-hmm. I, I guess the other kind of context I think we're struggling with is is really implementation of the existing treaties is, is one of our biggest uh, obstacles, and that requires money. Uh, I think another thing you've seen in the Northwest Territories is that uh, eventually the lawyers get involved and they interpret the modern treaties in the narrowest possible form. So, you know, mm-hmm. what was negotiated 20 years ago, <laughs> and, and you see each negotiating table trying to get a little bit more than the last treaty. A- and it, it leads to this situation where they're not really living documents. In many cases, we haven't even implemented them, and other indigenous governments are saying, no, no, that agreement is outdated. It, it's, you know, Section 35, the courts have moved beyond what Canada was willing to put in an agreement 20 years ago. Um, so all that's to say, I, what do you... Is, do you see an ability for legislation to kind of move that problem forward of saying that, you know, there there is a floor here beyond Section 35, there is a floor of rights beyond, you know, what a treaty looked like in 1980, and, and everyone just, every indigenous government has those rights. And that's something I would like to do, but I just, it seems a monumental task to then go away and draft legislation that somehow gets over that hurdle of the lowest common denominator interpretation of the the most recent treaty. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Emily Johnson. Dr. Nichols, did you want to respond? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I, I think uh, again, uh, the the way that I would characterize legislation of the, of, of this uh, character, and and I've looked at the interpretive problems of both the the proposed uh, like two six two, and I think C fifteen. I, I don't really know the exact shape of the the front matter that's really going to be the interpretive framework of how the appended um, on, on drip is going to be interpreted. Um, and the BC legislation has uh, some more unique uh, uh, approaches to doing that. They talk about uh, indigenous organizations or governments. They use a vaguer term that might be useful, might not. I think that um, legislation of this character, like it's, it's almost impossible to speculate in terms of what it will do once it's out there with lawyers um, and operating with government officials uh, and, and being practiced by indigenous peoples. It, it's a set of vocabulary tools, right? I think that <clears throat> free prior and informed consent is useful because it helps um, people like me put pressure um, on formalistic arguments that ignore the role of consent in our Section 35 jurisprudence and ignore the role of um, <clears throat> the continuing legacy uh, of, uh, of, of doctrine of discovery type logic uh, about crown sovereignty as steamrolling these processes and ending us up in, in really like the inability to make agreements because we're always at the table and then always litigating, right? Um, and so, like... I, I, it's sort of an unsatisfying response, I, I would say, to you as legislators, because it's really hard to determine what the future of this legislation is going to look like. Like I, I um, myself and Professor Morales at, at UBIC Law have edited a special issue of the UBC Law Review that's going to come out shortly on Bill 41. And there are uh, specialists um, weighing in on how to interpret that piece of legislation. Um, so, I mean, maybe some commentary uh, of that type might be useful uh, in the legislative phase uh, to look at how existing legislation could be used. But again, it, it relies on a kind of legal analysis that's, you know, like speculative to a degree. Because until we get case law, until it begins to move, its fate is not going to be determined. Um, and so my tendency is to look at it uh, as, as a way to lean Section 35 away from the idea that uh, federal power under 9124 is absolute and unquestionable um, and push Section 35 towards um, being seen as something that it actually is, which is outside of the charter, not subject to Section 1 um, and jurisdictional in character. Right? And I think that the Canadian courts and their jurisprudence are <clears throat> in part leaning towards that, but they're split. Like if we look at Mikasu Cree, the most recent uh, uh, case, Mikasu 2, that came down by the Supreme Court just a couple years ago, we can see post-McLaughlin a deep split in the court of how to really uh, deal with the duty to consult and accommodate and the concept of the honor of the crown. Right, um, And I think that the courts are in need of better guidance. Uh, and I hope that this kind of legislation can help along with principled legal arguments that rely upon case law and history um, to encourage them. But I, I don't know if that's uh, the kind of uh, advice that you as, as legislators are hoping for. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. I have next on my list, uh, Madam Premier, did you have questions or comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me now? No? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, last time I think I had technical problems too. It's like, please don't tell me again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I have uh, two questions. One is around, um, um, you know, I, I hear, it takes me back to some of my university days like 20 years ago, so <laughs> in fairness. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, ideology within it and, and, and in fairness, the uh, I, I I I thank you for the honor that you give to Indigenous people and recognizing the the relationships and and the importance of First Peoples and so I, I do start with that. But I want to you know I, I think sometimes we get stuck on on um, just the legislation is is the act and I I don't I want to kind of challenge a bit and say that it's more than just the legislation that's kind of what, from one aspect but it's how you deal with people. Um, within the Northwest Territories, I mean, I've, I've heard from Indigenous governments now that because the implementation of the United Nations Declaration is on our list of priorities, but but uh, governments that have modern treaty agreements now are afraid of it because they're hearing other governments that don't um, have their agreements done 
um, saying maybe we're not going to do the agreements now. Maybe we throw it out and, and the United Nations Declaration is where we go. Um, but I, that's one point. But the other thing is is around um, not only are we are we doing uh, modern treaties as the MLA had stated, but we're also there's other things that we're doing. We have what's called an intergovernmental council that sits together with all of us as equal partners, indigenous governments that signed on to devolution and the GNWT and and all of us are equals in that. And we make decisions regarding our royalties in the NWT and, and we have, you know, land and water boards. We have a, a new thing that we did with the uh, intergovernmental council around our legislative process on any legislation that will be implemented with land and, and water. Um, so I just want to say, I, I want to. I guess the first question is: Are we on the right track? Is it more than just having a, a, a piece of legislation that can be misinterpreted? Is it, is it actually implementing the principles um, of what they should be? That'd be my first question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Premier. Dr. Nichols. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I, I think that part of it, in, uh, my response would 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 focus on um, what we see the role of legislation is to contributing to on the ground processes. Um, and I, I would like to sort of encourage a move away from the idea that legislation is, is what would we, we could call a one way projection of authority from top down towards everyday reality, and rather as providing a, a, a set of vocabulary tools, a set of concepts that can be used to reflect what um, parties that are engaged in negotiations and conflicts over the meaning of, of agreements that they're in the process of setting up or agreements that they're in the process of, of governing together and, and co-management arrangements um, can draw from and, and have different perspectives on the meaning. So we don't get caught up um, in technical, formal interpretations of things that lock things down and prevent things from happening on the ground. I think what I would try to um, encourage people to see UNDRIP legislation as um, is something that could maybe um, resolve some of that formalistic deadlock that gets us around board tables uh, with lawyers arguing about the meaning of Section 35 and then heading to court for a decade of litigation instead of actually doing the work of, of ongoing shared governance. And I think in many regards, the North is, is the leader in this because um, they don't have the pretensions of provincial legislatures and the set of 92 powers that they have that they jealously guard, right? Um, there's a more flexible framework um, um, in the North. And I, and I think in that regard, you know, deep consultative processes with all of the Indigenous nations and stakeholders up North um, into this legislation to make sure that everybody understands what it could do and that it doesn't, you know, um, result in better bargains for people who are doing negotiations now as before, because it reformulates the relationship between the Crown um, and Indigenous peoples in light of the best um, interpretation of Section 35 and, and Canadian history instead of the formalistic um, interpretation that continues to use the doctrine of discovery is just too shy to say its name. Um, so again, it, it, it's sort of a, a, a general response to, to what I see is a real problem. There are many Indigenous communities that are hesitant about UNDRIP, and I understand that. It, there are compromises uh, in the document, Article 46, and, and uh, is usually among them, right, territorial integrity and political unity. Um, but I think if we take a treaty federalism lens to Article 46, we can respond to a lot of those um, concerns that Indigenous peoples have by saying that uh, if we have an understanding of shared sovereignty that's more consistent with uh, the better side of, of Canadian legal and constitutional history, um, then um, a, a form of jurisdiction that Indigenous peoples have doesn't threaten the political unity of Canada, it enhances it, and it doesn't disrupt the territorial integrity because we're not talking about the creation of brand new nation states, right? Um, we're talking about coherently reordering the division of powers within one. Um, and so I think a lot of it is um, having enriched discussions leading up, right, which which is sort of uh, uh, thankfully in part outside of my purview. I can just talk about the, the, the formal parts and the, and the history. Um, thank you for your question. Madam Chair, do you have your mute on? No, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, can hear you now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Madam Premier. Do you have a follow up? Yes, uh, thank you for that answer. Actually, it was uh, actually really informative and, and good. Uh, um, the other question I have is more of a high level kind of theoretical kind of question. Um, when you talk about the, the whole of Canada and nation, kind of rethinking our whole constitutional framework, I think, is what I'm hearing. And, and so I guess my question is, is um, how do you envision such a shift in our constitutional framework would be accomplished with so many nations across Canada? And, and when you talk about the free prior and informed consent, I mean, even in the small amount of nations that we have within the NWT, um, it's really difficult. It takes a long time to get to consensus on the smallest of matters. So how would we, how do you envision that even happening? Um, within the principle of free prior informed consent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Premier. Dr. Nichols? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll try two shots at, at this in, in different ways. I'll start with um, how the duty to consult and accommodate reflects uh, particular problems within um, our current understanding of, of Section 35. Uh, Part of the problem that it that it uh, has is the notion that consultation um, is somehow similar to negotiation, right? Um, so, in the original Haida framework, you have the notion of consent as existing on the possible spectrum, right? So, consent isn't new in Canadian law, and consent was there because it's a recognition of the inherent nature of this relationship. It's deep, it's constitutional, and in certain cases, consent will be required. Right? This is not a new concept. Um, and yet, the way that the duty to consult and accommodate has been practiced, consent has been placed as a kind of theory that's never been used. It's like title used to be before Chilcotin Nation. Um, and Indigenous peoples have been continually wanting to do negotiations, right? But in order to do negotiations, you have to be able to say no to an agreement. Like, that's just a base level assumption of any negotiation process. Consultation which is I'll listen to you and then ultimately unilaterally decide is not going to produce workable outcomes, right? Like, and this is not news. Um, like the Penner report, so many governmental reports on what Aboriginal self-government should mean and what Section 35 should mean have reiterated the same thing. Um, and I think the only way that we can honestly begin to reduce the degree of complexity and the amount of time that we spend in courts is to remember that, that our courts have actually created a workable reconciliation model that's not under Section 35, right? Um, the, the secession reference sets out a very clear relationship that the courts should have in these kinds of processes, right? Um, it envisions a process where if someone says no, you sit around the table and negotiate it out, and if you can't reach mutual agreement, then the door is open to leave. The unbalanced table that Section 35 gives us with ultimate unilateral authority in the Crown um, is just never going to achieve the kind of outcomes we need to achieve. And I think it's always going to have to teeter between two inconsistent and un, uh, like um, basically like contradictory concepts, one being mutual agreement and consent in the process of treaty making that the North is actively engaged in, and the other being unilateralism, that every once in a while the courts need to deviate to because they feel pressured or whatever is it in them that draws them that, to that picture of the constitutional order. And I think legislation is just a small step towards a process that you know the the, the Penner report envisioned, which was um, you know indigenous the, the getting rid of the Indian Act altogether, uh, indigenous nations going through a process of, of constitution building and moving towards a coherent and explicit constitutional framework, as opposed to a, a kind of patchwork um, process that ends up in the courts for decades and then produces inconsistent outcomes over time. Um, and I think that 30 years past Barrow, it's about time we sort of look back at what we have built that could be retained and what we have built that is simply unjustifiable. Uh, and, and I think that uh, UNDRIP helps us just shine a little bit of a light on the parts that just won't cohere if we really want to move forward um, and don't want to end up in a position where, um, you know, we have we have Indigenous folks saying reconciliation is dead and moving towards uh, blockades and other forms of, of, of action because they can't get negotiated agreements. Thank you. Um, I will move on to our next committee member, MLA Marcellos. Did you have questions or comments? 
thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to thank Dr. Nichols for his presentation. Um, it was uh, it was an excellent presentation, and um, I agree on a lot of his points. Uh, I I realize how Section 35 is uh, interpreted as just a, a tool for consulting and not uh, uh, not real negotiation, and uh, and that's happening constantly, even in uh, in in present form with. Uh, many of our First Nations. Uh, it's a little bit different up here because uh, uh, we have not a large population and uh, uh, we, you know, there's, uh, there's lots of feelings involved and we know everybody in the North. Um, a lot of our, uh, our holdup is, uh, is the federal government mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, whole issue of uh, you know, if they uh, for one little word, uh, you can't uh, move ahead to implement a claim or implement a section of a claim, or even though uh, the claim has been signed and delivered and uh, has been negotiated and finalized. And uh, these are some of the problems that uh, that I see. And uh, you know, and a lot of times, uh, uh, when uh, you have uh, someone uh, that will say this is what is interpreted with this, and then another. Uh, someone they change uh, shoes and then they they say that it's uh, this is the uh, this is this interpretation which is entirely different a little bit different with one word and they make it so complicated for uh, indigenous groups to move forward and to be prosper in the society that they should be prospering in and uh, you know I see that even even. Uh, even just looking at some of the uh, things before the uh, government of the Northwest Territories, because uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, negotiation is with the federal government, uh, and uh, it's a it's a very uh, funny place to be in. But uh, that this is the way it is as a former uh, chief and leader of uh, uh, First Nation for the last 12 years before I became an MLA. I've seen all these problems and how emotional it could get, mm -hmm. and um, and and most of the time the onus is on the federal government. Mm -hmm. It's uh, they uh, they don't uh, they're so impersonal, uh, so uh, uh, they're, it's, it's almost like the uh, negotiator comes into a room and uh, and makes it look like. Uh, uh, it's almost like a, it's not a it's not a negotiation a, no, a negotiation anymore, and it's not on, mut on mutual respect. It's mm -hmm. on making sure that the First Nation doesn't get what they they're asking, and that's the way I interpret a lot of the stuff and saw it so many times. And a lot of times, you know, you they come in the room and they're trying to consult under Section Thirty Five, and even the territorial government. When I was a leader, and. Um, I used to just tell them right at the beginning that uh, you know uh, this is uh, we're, this is not part of consultation. Uh, we are just here to listen to what you have to present to us because it just gets to uh, it gets too uh, crazy when you're dealing with bureaucrats and mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes I, I you know I'm very strong about that because uh, it uh, you know you, it can confuse uh, the First Nation. It confuses everyone and. Uh, when you want to give uh, an impression of strong leadership, you have to be above all that and try to actually negotiate with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very, it's sometimes, uh, it's, it's, uh, I can see what's happening even with some of the, the claims that are out there now. And uh, there's no willingness to actually settle. And uh, we have to be able to be in that uh, space in order to do that. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and uh, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Marcellos. Did you have anything to respond, Dr. Nichols? Yeah, uh, thank you very much um, uh, for sharing that experience. I, I think that it, it speaks to a lot of, of what I hope the UNDRIP legislation could contribute to, which is, is really clearing um, a view of what our constitutional order is. Uh, is and the, the mixed um, principles that are in section 35 so we can move past a lot of this um, like legal legalistic confusion over definitions 
right? Um, and we can actually get a practical, working, constitutional order that allows people to make mutual agreements. That is not a high bar. That's supposed to be a minimum bar for a constitution. And if we look at um, how Section 35 works in front of our courts to deal with conflicts between usually um, provincial legislatures and or, and or the federal government, we could take a house it as a really good example, right? Uh, uh, how's it uh, starts as a BC case back and around, uh, and this is approximately, so if it, it's different than that, I'm just I'm going off the top of my head, around 2011, um, as a BC Superior Court case um, by uh, the how's it for a commercial scale multi species fishing right, um, which they get recognition of uh, at that trial level, right? And then the DFO says that they're going to do test fisheries, they, they're not sure what this means as they continue to litigate. Right? Um, and we're still getting a house of decisions to this day. And it's an incoherent mess what this actually means. And millions of dollars have been spent, taxpayer dollars and indigenous dollars, who th- like they cannot afford this kind of waste. Now, if that is a workable legal model, I, I have no what I have no idea what to say to you. You know what I mean? Like that that is not a workable legal model. That is someone taking advantage of a tilted set of of power relationships and just saying, well, I'll litigate you into non-existence. And and then patting itself on the back and saying, yeah, I have the best constitution in the world. Anyone who wants to say that the Canadian um, government, the Canadian constitutional order is the best in the world at protecting indigenous rights needs to have their head examined a little bit. Right? Nation states are not very good at protecting indigenous peoples. Nation states have representative governments and so often indigenous peoples are a small fractional minority and are not represented by that government very well. So if they didn't attend the negotiations for adopting UNDRIP, that doesn't reflect anything that nation, other than the fact that nation states are really bad at protecting or talking to or making agreements with indigenous peoples. Um, and so all I can say is that I, I hope that legislation like this clears some of that fog so that we don't get stuck with professional negotiators around a table while nothing happens. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Uh, Ms. Marcellus, did you have any other questions? Comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Nichols for that co- those comments. I think that, uh, uh, you know, he was very clear and uh, uh, in, his, uh, in his interpretation of what I was trying to say, and I agree with him completely. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, MLA Marcellos. Um, I will now move on to Minister Wozniak. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much, Dr. Nichols, for the presentation. Um, I, 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 I know we're only allowed two questions, so I think what I'm going to do is sort of wind up squishing the first one uh, as a preface into my second, um, and then hopefully that way I can hang on to our, our response if I need to at the end. Um, and where I'd initially thought to, to ask you some questions with, with respect to, you know, I know you've talked about the direction here as being uh, that the idea of legislation around UNDRIP or the declaration would provide us a set of tools, would provide us a new set of tools and new tools in the toolbox. Um, shift the vocabulary, shift the understanding of meaning, and give us all a starting point uh, from which to have further conversations if we have a mutual understanding of what some of these different terms might mean. Um, but then I, my next area that I go to is what, is what is really the goal that we are trying to accomplish? And again, I hear you answering this uh, for us in saying, look, it's time to understand a nation-to-nation concept of jurisdiction rather than boxes of rights that create unending litigation. So and my question that I get to that is, do, do we not need to be at that understanding first? I mean, how do I not need to already be at the understanding of a nation-to-nation relationship um, before I can go about legislating what I'll say is my, as, you know, as, the G, as a representative of the GNWT, my concept of what this law should look like? I mean, that it's almost... I'm concerned that we'd be doing it backwards if we don't already have the understanding of nation-to-nation um, connections of a modern treaty understanding. Does legislating this kind of actually take away from that ultimate goal? So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at, at that for my starting one. Thanks. 
Thank you, Minister Wozniak. Dr. Nichols? Sure. I, I think that it, it's good to be aware of how um, legal language works in a constitutional order, especially in an adversarial system like we have. We are constantly uh, debating over the meaning of legal principles and concepts, right? We don't have uniform views of, of what a constitutional order even is. We have different uh, perspectives that build up over time, right? So to, to come to the problem and say that we have to all have a concept of nation-to-nation federalism and that's the only coherent view of the Crown Indigenous relationship, I mean, it would be great if we could uh, to get there. But I, the question I would have is how, right? Um, we've been litigating uh, on Section 35 for over 30 years post-Sparrow. Um, and I, like, as a scholar of Section 35 jurisprudence, I can point to like multiple camps that interpret in, in very different ways. Um, so we have different pictures of our constitutional order. I would say two families, right? One family is that you just can't question state sovereignty. Once state sovereignty is enacted, it's really a kind of either it'll default to a might equals right kind of idea or some sort of legal formalism that rides on that and says that's the political reality. I'm just the legal reality. Um, Or you'll have a view that says that, well, constitutional orders are um, are like contracts. They're mutual agreements. They're revised over time. Right. This this camp. is the more historical or common law approach uh, that we see to constitutional orders. Um, But what we never have is one consistent picture of what a constitutional relationship is, even between subjects and their sovereign, uh, let alone between indigenous peoples and the crown. So I don't think we can approach it like that. Um, I think that when I refer to tools, I'm talking about the introduction of new concepts that different parties who are arguing over the meaning of something like a constitutional order can use in order to try to make sense of it. Right. Um, Especially to uncover um, moves that are being made in on one view of the constitutional order that are quite opaque and and can't be sort of unpacked and end up in a lot of vagueness and confusion. Uh, Tools like free prior and informed consent raise a question of where's consent in Canadian law. Right. And what's the meaning of it? Um, So I don't know. I, I, I hope that that was helpful. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Minister Wozniak. Thank you. No, and and it certainly is helpful because I do think, as a legislator, and and but also as government, we need to be mindful for us of what is the, the objective and purpose of the legislation that we are drafting and writing. Um, and so, to understand the goal that we are trying to achieve, I think as a starting place is really quite critical. If we don't have that understanding of our true goal, where we're trying to get to. Um, of what we're trying to fix or better or improve, then you know our starting place of saying we want to enact, um, we want to we want to implement UNDRIP, we want to implement declaration. Um, if that's our goal, that's one thing. But I, I think the process of, of this committee has shown us already that that's that's not that's not the only goal, and that's not enough of a goal. And then we need to be more mindful and more thoughtful where we're where we're driving this. So so yeah, understanding what we can get to, I think, is very helpful. I, so I do appreciate that. Um, mm-hmm. But there's still going to be limitations on us as a territorial government, right? I mean, our our own toolbox, um, which I think we are uh, quite, we, we cannot reject uh, where we find ourselves in the Canadian Constitution as a territorial government. It constrains the the framework of where of how much we can create concepts and introduce concepts, and even if we are saying here's our point in time understanding of the different relationships within the territory between nations to nations and how we will interact it is still going to be a point in time and it is always going to for us be subject to where we as a territorial government fit in the existing jurisdictional constitution of canada even if we're saying we want it to shift and be different we as a government are going to be stuck in it. So it's, it does create a bit of a, a challenge for me. So that was throughout the, your, your presentation. I always kept going, you know, I hope you're giving the same presentation to the federal government because it would certainly make our job a lot easier at this point. But anyway, that's all for now. That's not really a question so much as a comment, but uh, I'll appreciate any, any response you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Wozniak. Dr. Nichols, did you have anything to respond to that? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. And it's interesting to try to think from uh, the perspective of, of, you know, a very unique body of, of legislators that are up working much closer to the ground um, than a lot of uh, provincial uh, uh, of their provincial um, 
friends, let's call them, um, <clears throat> or their federal ones. Uh, I think that if I were to kind of think about the best possible outcome for UNDRIP legislation in the North, um, I, I would think that it has to do... Uh, it has to be able to enhance and show the, the best view of what you're up to in, in the formulation of and, and management and, self, and governance of modern treaties, right? It has to have that built in. And I think that one way of perhaps thinking about it is moving away from the BC legislation entertains these sort of reports um, uh, about how this is doing, which doesn't seem to necessarily like it'll consult Indigenous peoples about how these go, and then it'll sort of tell the government its own report card and how it's doing. And that consultative kind of structure, I think, would be nice to get rid of um, and move towards a, a kind of um, a reporting mechanism that would involve going out and actually dialoguing, uh, right? That would be a shared responsibility. Um, of going out and seeing how this is working with people and not just reporting back, um, but like coming together with how, how this is working out and using it as a mechanism to put pressure on the federal government about what this process is, which I think that they have a very outdated model, right? Like the Penner report suggested the, the removal of uh, what was then INAC and to stop listening to those lawyers. And they're still there and they still have that view. Right? And they're kind of getting in the way. And I think that there's a few different ways to put pressure on them. And I think that where and what exactly kind of political animal territorial governments are is a weird question, actually, in, in Canada. You can't really be seen as a municipality now, can you? I mean, you have too much of a democratic principle to be coherently be seen as a municipality. And so if, say, the none of a territorial government with, you know, a, a, a majority indigenous population decided to run a secession reference, like Quebec, what exactly do you think our courts could say coherently? Right. I think that there are ways to put pressure on the federal government about what exactly is happening in the north. And I would hope to see this legislation as a way of doing that. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. I will now move on to MLA O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Kevin O'Reilly, MLA for Frame Lake. Um, yeah, so you're the, the fourth speaker that we've heard from, and I, I did uh, appreciate your, your thoughts today. And so we've had everything from Tom Isaac, who says that UNDRIP is completely unimplementable and way too vague and uh, so on to uh, folks like yourself and uh, who I think have indicated that there is some value in it and that it can help guide, say, territorial legislation if we go down that route. And then we've had Nuri Frame, who's done work with the Tlicho government. They, they also have a... a a land rights agreement. They have a self-government agreement. They have uh, they've defined their rights quite well. And for them, a lot of the issue is really around implementation and forming other kinds of arrangements to help better define uh, their areas of jurisdiction, perhaps in, in socioeconomic areas and so on. Then we heard from Hayden King, uh, prof, uh, and I'm trying to remember exactly what he told us. But so we, we've heard a lot of different views, and I'm still as a uh, lowly regular Emily trying to figure out what's the right thing to do here and is legislation from our government going to help move implementation of the concepts defined uh, within UNDRIP along and I, I haven't made up my mind yet because uh, I'm hearing different views so but I I guess I, I do uh, agree with your view of this you know concurrent uh, shared uh, spheres of uh, sovereignty um, and I'm not sure that legislation can really be used to, to define those uh, in the ways that keep them as uh, uh, something that's um, grounded in reality and able to evolve over time and so on so uh, it seems to me uh, legislation might be helpful but what we really need here is almost some form of constitutional development for the Northwest Territories in terms of how Indigenous governments are going to relate to a public consensus 
uh, based uh, uh, government. And we started off down that path a, a few times in the past with um, not so great results, but I guess I'm looking for your advice, insights into um, whether that's something that we should pursue or not. And given some of the constraints that my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Emily Wozniak talked about it, understanding, of course, that GNWT itself is only a creature of the federal government. Um, uh, you know, uh, and not that that should really hold us back in any way, but any advice, suggestions f in terms of constitutional development for the Northwest Territories as a way to better um, set out and help define these spheres of sovereignty and more importantly when they intersect and how do you resolve differences because I think that's mm -hmm. where we're probably going to end up going thanks for mm -hmm. a long rambling opportunity to ask a question <laughs> thank you MLA O'Reilly Dr. Nichols yeah, no, thank you very much for that question I, I, I think that uh, I'll kind of address it and try to go at two wings. One would be um, how courts uh, deal with division of powers, typically. right? And Section 91 and Section 92, you know, conflicts between provinces and the federal government, we have lots of jurisprudence on and a, a rich tradition on how to do this. A big part of our problem is that Section 35 is drafted in such a way that, like 91 and 92, it's not subject to Section 1 override in the scheme, right? It's outside um, of the ambit of the Charter. It's not subject to provincial override. So on its face, in terms of our the common law tradition of constitutionalism that we inherit, this should be... Um, you know, a part of the, the third order of government, a division of powers. And yet we went with a, a compromise interpretation that led us towards a charter-like interpretation that then led us to these tables of consultation instead of negotiation. And so I think you're right, very right in highlighting that legislation can't be what decides what parties do in an ongoing constitutional negotiation and agreement that forms their relationship. That's a very problematic view. Um, and yet what we have with Section 35 as it is, is these negotiating tables that are interminable. They never end because they're not negotiations, they're consultations. And we have no idea what we're doing. We just can like generations are born and die as as people argue these. Right. Like we don't even have can't even contain the the the, the process to the lifetime of like uh, government officials. Um, and so. I, I see this legislation as not being a snap your fingers solution to this process, but actually, really, actually, a step towards the kind of constitutional negotiation that you're talking about, right? But it's very difficult to encourage the federal government to amend the Constitution. We all know how the amending formulas look, right? But what we can do is encourage the the Supreme Court to shift its interpretation of what those constitutional documents mean. That is its responsibility, right? And it did so in the person's case when it allowed women the ability to actually pro to participate in, in, in government. Right? That, that wasn't legislated in. That wasn't positive law. That, that was the courts. Um, and so the courts can be encouraged to have a better view. And so I would encourage to you to see the legislation not as setting the framework by where everybody has to play, but helping to clarify the framework that we're currently in and encouraging a better vision of it. Because I think that the parties that are currently sitting around the table see the table that they're at very differently. Indigenous people see the table as they are talking about their inherent rights and they are negotiating shared sovereignty. The federal government says, these are what you're going to get, take it or leave it. Right? And we'll use the court's to litigate our way through. And I think that the fact that you've heard, you know, um, other experts speak from other angles, I mean, it's, it's good. Get as, as many views as you possibly can. But it's an extremely complicated problem. Section 35 uh, um, jurisprudence is probably one of the most complicated bodies of jurisprudence out there, along with U.S. federal Indian law and other similar species of law. And it's because they have mixed principles, and that makes them into a kind of legal labyrinth. Like, good luck working your way through it without training. Um, so I would suggest, if uh, you know, continuing to, to hear from other experts, Professor Gunn uh, is a you know world expert in, in UNDRIP. She will provide you uh, with great insight. Um, I would suggest taking a look at some of the people who had roles in in the process of, of the making of UNDRIP, someone like Sackage Henderson, right? Sackage is, is uh, still around and, and writing and, and doing work. Uh, Leroy Littlebear, 
right? Um, Gordon Christie out at UBC, John Burroughs. There's there's a lot of good people to, to hear from. Maybe like instead of just individual speakers, some panels. I know that there's a lot of limitations that that um, the current situation places on us. Um, you know, it, it would be nice to be there with you and 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 have a, a, a couple other speakers to, to to share the room and hear your experiences a bit better. Um, but I, I can only suggest you're going to hear different angles from from different people, and I hope that that would enrich your understanding of, of of the of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Uh, MLA O'Reilly, did you have a follow up? Uh, no, uh, no, that's uh, uh, very helpful. Um, yeah, I, I just got to mull my way through this. <laughs> but uh, thanks for the presentation today. Thank you. All right. So are there any further questions I, from committee members? If there are no further questions um, from committee members, Dr. Nichols, do you have any closing remarks that you would like to make to committee? Uh, no, just to, to thank you again for um, inviting me to speak with you. Uh, the, the North is, um, uh, is something in my research that is um, becoming much uh, of, of a focus where I think the future of federalism is being lived on an everyday reality. Um, and I'm uh, part of a, a research project that recently got approved that'll be doing work uh, up in the Northwest Territories for the next five years, as soon as we get past uh, COVID. So hopefully we'll have the opportunity to have uh, conversations in person in um, the relatively near future. Yes, thank you. So uh, now I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to say thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nichols, for providing your presentation to us. This concludes the public portion of our meeting, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I need a motion to go in camera. MLA Johnson has moved that committee mo goes into camera. We will now go into camera we will now disconnect the live stream and take a five minute short break. Um, and does committee members, if any committee members, just so we can uh, let Dr. Nichols go, if there are any further questions in camera that any members want to ask, if not, then we will, before we take our quick break, um, just let me know. Hearing none, then I would like to again, thank you, Dr. Nichols, um, and thanks for the presentation. So you can sign off now. Thank you, bye. Bye. I've been on uh, this seat since uh, 10 o'clock this morning. I just need to take a couple minute break.